Amen. Amen. Uh, if you go ahead and turn in your Bibles to the book of 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 17, uh, we'll begin there tonight in 2 Samuel chapter 17. Just before we get started, uh, I just want to warn you that there's going to be a lot of reading tonight, uh, which is great for you because you don't have to pronounce these names, uh, but I will give it my best shot. Uh, but yeah, there is quite a bit of reading tonight because this is all really one story over the, the next couple of chapters. So I'm just going to tell you ahead of time. We're going to do a lot of reading, so you can't say I didn't warn you. But uh, chapter 17, verse 1 is where we're going to start. But before we begin, let's pray. Lord, thank you. Thank you for tonight. As we sang, Lord, you make the darkness tremble. You silence fear. Your name is a light that the shadows can't deny. Lord, it's all about you. And so tonight, as we gather together in the middle of a, a busy week, a stressful week, and, and all those things just swirling around in our lives and in everything that we have going on, Lord, uh, help this to just be a time where we can sit back and relax and listen to your word and hear your voice speaking to us and showing us um, ways that we should modify our, our behavior, ways that we can follow you more closely. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. 2 Samuel chapter 17, uh, verse 1. But before we begin, uh, just a quick recap. So David is king of Israel, and everything's going great until he has this affair with Bathsheba. Well, at least that's the, the climax of what had been going on. David had a problem. It was a very uh, frustrating sin issue in David's life that he just could not get enough of women. And so he had filled his life with many wives and concubines and people. Uh, and so because of that, you know, it led to this adulterous, murderous affair with Bathsheba, which brought about a judgment on David that came through Nathan the prophet by the word of the Lord that there would be consequence in not only David's life, but in the lives of his sons as well. And we saw last week that consequence pay off as Absalom, son of David, who had murdered his older brother, the crown prince of Israel, had rebelled against his father, had led an insurrection Tre uh, treacherously, treasonously brought the nation of Israel under his command, and the people of Israel were with Absalom. Okay? So in the midst of all of this, David is exiled. He leaves the city of Jerusalem. He runs for the wilderness, but as he's doing so, he's not doing so as a conquering king, as a warrior who's looking to get back in the fight. He's doing so as a very defeated man who realizes that his sin, his rebellion, his compromise has led to this place in his life and his own son has betrayed him. But as he's going into the wilderness, he encounters a couple different people and he ends up sending back the priests and he ends up sending back one of his trusted advisors to go be inside the city while Absalom reigns as king, as insurgents, as spies for David. And then David sets out into the wilderness to kind of, in a sense, resurrect his relationship with the Lord. And last week we talked about these different psalms that David wrote during this time that show that everything has now shifted in focus to the fact that he does not deserve the grace that God has given him. He's repented. He's walking in relationship again with the Lord. But the problem is, as we learned at the end of our time together last week, Ahithophel, this advisor to Absalom, he's very, very well trusted, not just by uh, Absalom, but he had been well trusted by David as well. In fact, the end of chapter 16 told us, tells us that in the eyes of Absalom and David, this guy Ahithophel, his words were like the word of God. It was sound counsel. It was good. And so we asked ourselves, why is Ahithophel leading and helping Absalom in this rebellion and insurrection against David? And what we discovered last week was Ahithophel is Bathsheba's grandfather. And so in the midst of all of this, he's upset, he's frustrated about what happened to his granddaughter, he's frustrated by what's going on in the kingdom, and so he's decided to lead Absalom in this rebellion. But the last thing that David did 
um, on his way out was pray that the Lord would make the advice of Ahithophel seem foolish to Absalom. So here's where we get to verse 1 of chapter 17. All of that to get here. Moreover, Ahithophel said to Absalom, let me choose 12,000 men and I will arise and pursue David tonight. I will come upon him while he is weary and discouraged and throw him into a panic and all the people who are with him will flee. I will strike down only the king. And I will bring all the people back to you as a bride comes home to her husband. You seek the life of only one man, and all the people will be at peace. And the advice seemed right in the eyes of Absalom and all the elders of Israel. Let's just stop there for a second, briefly, just to point this out. This is actually really good advice. Ahithophel said, let me take 12,000 men, that's a lot, right? And let me rush over to where David's encamped. I'll storm them, I'll overload them, and I will kill David. Because if David's dead and I kill him, then all the people will turn to you, Absalom. So this is pretty good. This is a solid plan. Again, he's a wise guy. Even the terminology he uses, like a bride is delivered to her groom. I will deliver the kingdom to you, Absalom. So it's good advice. And Absalom and the elders think it's good advice. But then Absalom said, call Hushai the archite also and let us hear what he has to say. Remember, Hushai is the advisor that David ran into on his way out of town. And he said, I'm with you, King David. And David said, no, go back and pledge your allegiance to Absalom so that you can counteract Ahithophel. So look what it says here, verse 6. And when Hushai came to Absalom, Absalom said to him, Thus has Ahithophel spoken. Shall we do as he says? If not, you speak. And then Hushai said to Absalom, This time the counsel that Ahithophel has given is not good. Hushai said, You know that your father and his men are mighty men. And that they are enraged like a bear robbed of her cubs in the field. Besides, your father is an expert in war. He will not spend the night with the people. Behold, even now he has hidden himself in one of the pits or in some other place. And as soon as some of the people fall at the first attack, whoever hears it will say, there has been a slaughter among the people who follow Absalom. And then even the valiant men... Man, whose heart is like the heart of a lion, will utterly melt with fear. For all Israel knows that your father is a mighty man, and that those who are with him are valiant men. But my counsel is that all Israel should be gathered to you, from Dan to Beersheba, as the sand by the sea for multitude, and that you go to battle in person. So we shall come upon him in some place where he is to be found, and we shall light upon him as the dew falls on the ground. And of him and all the men with him, not one will be left. If he withdraws into a city, then all Israel will bring ropes to that city, and we shall drag it into the valley until not even a pebble is to be found there. And Absalom and all the men of Israel said, the counsel of Hushai the archite, archite is better than the counsel of Ahithophel. For the Lord had ordained to defeat the good counsel of Ahithophel so that the Lord may bring harm upon Absalom. Then Hushai said to Zadok and Abathar the priests, Thus and so did Ahithophel counsel Absalom and the elders of Israel, and thus and so have I counseled. Now, therefore, send quickly and tell David, Do not stay tonight at the fords in the wilderness, but by all means pass over, lest the king and all the people who are with him be swallowed up. Now, Jonathan and Ahimaaz were waiting at Enrogel. A female servant was to go and tell them, and they were to go and tell King David, David, for they were not to be seen entering the city. But a young man saw them and told Absalom. So both of them went away quickly and came to the house of a man at Baharum, who had a well in his courtyard. And they went down into it. And the women took 
and spread a covering over the well's mouth and scattered grain on it, and nothing was known of it. And when Absalom's servants came to the women at the house, they said, Where are Ahimaaz and Jonathan? And the woman said to them, They have gone over the brook of water. And when they had sought and could not find them, they returned to Jerusalem. And after they had gone, the men came up out of the well and went and told King David. And they said to David, Arise and go quickly over the water, for thus and so has Ahithophel counseled against you. And then David arose and all the people who were with him, and they crossed the Jordan. And by daybreak, no one was left who had not crossed the Jordan. I promised you we were going to read a lot. But just to kind of understand what's happening here. Ahithophel's plan was smart. It was bold. It had a high probability of success. It's ancient military modern warfare. Everyone agrees if you cut the head off, it it will fall, right? And so he says, let's go quickly, let's attack them quickly, let's get in the fight quickly, let's kill David first, and let's, you know, cut the head off this thing, and you, Absalom, will be king. But what does Hushai counsel? Wait a minute. Patience, Absalom. Wait, gather all of Israel to you. It's going to take a while to get everybody there. And then when you have this mighty force, we will overwhelm David's men and crush and kill all of them. Hushai not only wanted to defeat the council of Ahithophel, but he wanted to buy time so that David could be warned and get his men out of harm's way. But we have to ask ourselves, why is Absalom rejecting Ahithophel's counsel? And this is actually the part that I think is most applicable to us. Ahithophel's plan was for Absalom to stay home and for Ahithophel to go and kill the king with the army. In his plan, he led the battle, and he won the victory for the king. But in Hushai's plan, Absalom led the battle. Hushai said, you go out, and you lead the people, and you kill King David. And because of that, Hushai appealed to the pride and the selfish nature of Absalom. He said, no, 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 no. Don't let this guy go get the glory. Don't let this guy go get the victory. You wait and you go get the victory. And so because of his pride, Absalom rejects wise counsel, even though it's evil, and chooses foolish counsel that actually intended him harm. Isn't that interesting? Isn't it interesting what our pride can do? How our pride can cause us to choose a way that's clearly not as good just simply because we want to receive the honor that we think we're due or we want to receive the the, the respect we think that we deserve. It's interesting how easily we are led uh, led astray by our own evaluation of our self-worth and self-importance. We have to be careful because that worldly idea of, you know, you need to have better self-esteem, you need to take pride in who you are. Like, I understand that there's some good motives behind saying some of those things, but it's very contrary to what Scripture teaches us. Like, Scripture clearly teaches us that pride is something to be laid down before the Lord, that we don't boast in ourselves, we boast in Christ crucified, right? We don't, we don't take self-esteem, we don't esteem ourselves, we, we humble ourselves before the Lord. And that's obviously not what Absalom is doing. So presented with two plans, he chooses the one that's going to bring him the most recognition. Well, Ahithophel sees this, and look what it says in verse 23. When Ahithophel saw that his counsel was not followed, he saddled his donkey and went off home to his own city. He set his house in order and hanged himself. And he died and was buried in the tomb of his father. Now it's important for us to see that Ahithophel did not commit suicide because he had hurt feelings because people weren't listening to what he was saying. He committed suicide because he was wise enough to realize that Hushai's plan would fail. He was wise enough to see that this was uh, something that was going to ultimately fall. And he knew that if David ever returned as king, that it would destroy Ahithophel, right? And so he goes and he does this. He takes his own life. 
knowing that he'd be humiliated if David returned. And so he would rather take his own life than fail in that way. Don't, we, don't you just see the, the massive arrogance in that? Like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do things the way I want to do things. I'm going to take my own life, and, and, and I'm going to be the one in control of this situation. I mean, ultimately, suicide is one of the most, if not the most, selfish thing that you could possibly do. It says, I'm going to make this all about me. I'm going to be the God in this situation, and the God who decides when life begins and when life ends, no, 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 I'm going to decide, right? And he walks into that. And inside of that, there's so many things that we could talk about around this idea of taking your own life. And I don't want to make this sermon about this tonight. But it's just important for us to see that, that pride and arrogance and, and evil intentions and selfishness and self-righteousness leads us to a path of destruction. In fact, I think about the person we most recently read about uh, taking his own life in this book, Saul. Do you remember? Saul is in battle. We read this several weeks ago. Saul is in battle, and, and he has uh, you know, been struck. He's wounded, and rather than allow his enemy to kill him, what does he do? He, he falls on his own sword, right? He, he, he kills himself. Like, again, it's, it's this path of, of self-righteousness and, and, and evil and destruction and pride and self-centeredness and self-focus, and all of that leads to a place of utter loneliness and destruction. And so we have to be careful that we don't allow ourselves to be tempted to, to walk in those patterns of life. Uh, 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 of course, it's, it's an easy thing to preach. Hey, don't have evil thoughts and intentions. But I'm talking about more than that. I'm talking about being consumed with ourselves, being self-focused, self-centered, our desires and our agenda being the most important thing. It will lead us to a destructive place. It just will. And we see this in the life of Ahithophel. Verse 24. Then David came to Manaheim, and Absalom crossed the Jordan with all the men of Israel. Now, Absalom had set Amasa over the army instead of Joab. Amasa was the son of a man named Ithra, the Ishmaelite, who had married Abigail, the daughter of Nahash, sister of Zeruah, Joab's mother. And Israel and Absalom encamped in the land of Gilead. And when David came to Manaheim, Shobai, the son of Nahash, from Rabbah of the Ammonites, and Machar, or Machir, the son of Emil, from Lodabar, and Baz Barzilia, I don't know, whatever, the Gileadite from Roglium brought beds and basins and earthen vessels and wheat and barley and flour and parched grain and beans and lentils and honey and curds and sheep and cheese from the herd for David and the people with him to eat. For they said, the people are hungry and weary and thirsty in the wilderness. We'll stop there for just a second. Um, it tells us here that Absalom has this general, Amasa. It's important to know that for later. Uh, and I tried to, like, family tree out this connection between him and Joab, and it's really confusing. But at the end of the day, you just need to know that this guy is related to Joab. So Joab is the uh, general of David's army, and now his relative, Amasa, is the general of Absalom's army. And so they get to this place, Manaheim, and these people who are foreigners— who are not Israelites, they feed David and his friends. They, they sustain him. They give him good gifts. They give him all that stuff that we read, wheat and barley and flour and sheep and goat cheese and whatever. And they had all this stuff to eat, so they sustained him. Chapter 18, verse 1. Then David mustered the men who were with him and set over them commanders of thousands and commanders of hundreds. And David sent out the army, one-third under the command of Joab, one-third under the command of Abishai, the son of Zeruah, Joab's brother, and one-third under the command of Ittai, the Gittite. And the king said to the men, I myself will also go out with you. But the men said, You shall not go out, for if we flee, they will not care about us. If half of us die, they will not care about us, but you are worth 10,000 of us. 
Therefore, it is better that you send us help from the city. And the king said to them, whatever seems best to you, I will do. So the king stood at the side of the gate while all the army marched out by hundreds and by thousands. And the king ordered Joab and Abishai and Ittai, deal gently for my sake with the young man Absalom. And all the people heard when the king gave orders to all the commanders about Absalom. So the army went out into the field against Israel, and the battle was fought in the forest of Ephraim. And the men of Israel were defeated there by the servants of David, and the loss there was great on that day, 20,000 men. The battle spread over the face of all the country, and the forest devoured more people that day than the sword. We'll stop there. So it's important for us to kind of see a a contrast here between Absalom and David. Now, in some ways, Absalom and David are very similar. You know, Absalom had committed act of rebellion against the Lord. He had uh, had relations with David's concubines on the roof. He had done all these things. Um, But David himself struggled with some of those types of sins. And, And so in some ways, they're similar But we see here distinct differences between how they received counsel. See, Absalom chose the counsel that had him being the hero, him riding out to battle, him leading the charge. And here's David saying to his commanders, hey, I'm going with you. Now, I can imagine part of that is, hey, last time I didn't ride into battle with you guys, I ended up committing this terrible sin with Bathsheba. So, like, you're not going alone. I'm going to war. So he's willing to go. He wants to fight. But his advisors say, no, 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 no. You stay here. Because if you go into battle and you die, it's going to destroy the morale of all the people. So you stay here and you provide leadership from the back and we'll go out to fight the battle. And what does David do? He says, whatever you think is best. Do you see that there's a difference in the pride of Absalom who is trying so desperately to be the hero of the story and the humility of David who's been broken and defeated and restored in his relationship with the Lord to say, I don't have to be the hero of this story. I can sit back And I can wait. David was not stubborn. He was not concerned with getting credit. He didn't have to lead the battle. But the battle itself is interesting when we look at the people who are riding out to be a part of it. There's the people who sustained him and provided resources for the camp we read about a moment ago. There's the people like Ittite, the Gittite, who are riding out into war. These are foreign servants who in conjunction with David's mighty men are going out into the battle for him. Remember, all of Israel, for the most part, is on the side of Absalom. And it's just interesting to me that this idea of these foreigners being brought into the plan really echoes the fact that Gentiles would one day be grafted in to the plan for God and for his redemption. Like one day, non-Jewish people would be the ones who stepped up to fight for the king. Just like in this day, David's great, 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 great grandson, Jesus, the king, the king of kings, also has people who are not Israelites in his army. We see that. We see the support for them in this moment. I don't think it's necessarily overtly being illustrated for us here, but we see that David was loyal to whoever was loyal to him. Good thing that he didn't say, these guys can't fight for us. They're not related to me, right? He said, hey, if you'll take my loyalty, or if you'll be loyal to me, I'll take you. Let's go. Let's fight the battle. But we also see that David is still harboring compassion for his son. Really, the only instruction that he gives is deal gently with Absalom. Um, What does that even mean? Like, this is a war. Like, this guy has committed treason. He's literally taken your throne. He's had relations with your concubines. He's shamed you and humiliated you. And here you are worried about him. But again, we see that humility and that compassion that flows from a heart that's right with God. And that's what's coming out of David's Life. And it's really sad when you think about it because this whole thing was pretty quick. It wasn't like this long, drawn-out thing. 
But it's pretty sad when you think about it that Absalom's pride and rebellion led to 20,000 deaths, it tells us. Like 20,000 men were slaughtered because of Absalom's pride and rebellion. And it just goes back to remembering that our sin doesn't just affect us. Our sin and our selfishness and our self-centeredness and our pride affects other people. And it definitely affected those 20,000 men who had to die over this dispute. So let's see what happens in verse 9. And Absalom happened to meet the servants of David. And Absalom was riding on his mule, and the mule went under the thick branches of a great oak. And his head caught fast in the oak, and he was suspended between heaven and earth. And while the mule that was under him went on, and a certain man saw it and said to Joab, Behold, I saw Absalom hanging in the oak. And Joab said to the man who told him, What? You saw him? Why then did you not strike him there to the ground? I would have been glad to give you ten pieces of silver and a belt. But the man said to Joab, Even if I felt in my hand the weight of a thousand pieces of silver, I would not reach out my hand against the king's son. For in our hearing the king commanded you and Abishai and Ittai, For my sake protect the young man Absalom. On the other hand, if I had dealt treacherously against his life, and there is nothing hidden from the king, then you yourself would have stood aloof. And Joab said, I will not waste time like this with you. And he took three javelins in his hand and thrust them into the heart of Absalom while he was still alive in the oak. And the ten young men, Joab's armor bearers, surrounded Absalom and struck him and killed him. Let's stop there for a second. So, kind of a crazy story. But I want to remind you of what we were told about Absalom. Just a couple chapters ago, in chapter 14, uh, at the beginning of it, we were told that Absalom was known for his good looks. Like he was a good-looking guy. But particularly, he was known for his long locks of hair. Okay? He had long hair. It said every year he would cut it in a ceremoniously kind of thing, and everyone would marvel at how beautiful and long Absalom's hair is. And isn't it interesting that the very thing that drove his vanity, the very thing that uh, people identified as being Absalom is the very thing that did him in ultimately? He's riding through this thick area of trees where you can't really get through and his hair gets caught in the branches and his donkey just, I mean, it's funny to think about, his donkey just keeps walking and there he is, I love that term, suspended between heaven and earth. He's just hanging there from the tree by his hair. And someone goes, um, Joab, isn't that Absalom over there hanging in the tree? And Joab says, well, why didn't you kill him? It's interesting, the servant's response where he says, hey, you couldn't pay me enough in the whole world to kill the king's son for for, for two reasons. One, if I killed him, we all heard what the king told you not to kill him. But number two, if I did, you wouldn't back me up. Remember, interestingly enough, that two times in the last 10, 15 chapters, enemies of David had been killed and the the person who killed them, like the guy who supposedly killed Saul and the guy who killed David's other enemy who tried to claim the throne, uh, when they came and reported it to David, what did David do? Killed them. Third time's the charm, right? This guy's going, hey, I'm not going to David and be like, I've killed Absalom, your enemy. And David's like, well, so be it also upon you. I'm not doing that. I saw that happen twice already in the last 15 chapters, right? (laughs) Like, I'm not doing that. So he's like, I'm not killing this guy. And Joab says, I don't have time for people like you. And he takes his three spears and he stabs Absalom with them. And then he has his 10 young, apparently that wasn't enough to kill Absalom. So then he has his 10 young men come and stab him as well. Now, part of that is uh, kind of an insurance policy, right? If everyone stabbed him, who really killed him? But Joab kills Absalom against David's wishes. Verse 16. Then Joab blew the trumpet, and the troops came back from pursuing Israel, for Joab restrained them. And they took Absalom and threw him into a great pit in the forest, and raised over him a very great heap of stones. And all Israel fled, every one to his own home. Now, Absalom in his lifetime had taken and set up for himself the pillar that is in the king's valley. For he said, 
I have no son to keep my name in remembrance. And he called the pillar after his own name, and it is called Absalom's monument to this day. Isn't it pretty crazy? Absalom builds a pillar to himself. Isn't that just the epitome of pride? I'm going to raise a monument to myself in the valley of the king so that people will remember me. It's interesting that Joab chose to, to kill Absalom and bury him in this nondescript way. It makes some sense. You, you bury this enemy in such a way that no one will know this is where he's buried so that people won't use his death as a rally point to, to resurrect the rebellion against the king. And you could almost say that Joab was correct in killing Absalom, his sworn enemy and the person who had betrayed the king, but he was not right in doing it. He was correct in understanding that it was better for Absalom to be dead than to be alive, but he was not right in disobeying (coughs) what David had told him. It wasn't Joab's place to be the executioner. In fact, this is something that Joab struggled with mightily in his life, right? Uh, This was the second time that he had killed someone. He had chosen to take upon himself to be judge, jury, and executioner uh, against someone who had rebelled against the king. But we see again in this monument a picture of Absalom's pride. He built a monument to himself. And as of the writing of this book, we're told, it's still there for you to go see. You can go to the Valley of the Kings and see the pillar of Absalom. And you'll know it's there. You know, it's interesting. I think many people today are trying to do this for themselves. Build a, build a pillar. Build, you know, many people to this day are, are trying to, what we might say in our world today, leave a legacy right? Uh, We want people to know we were here, remember my name, and things like that. But I think the greatest legacy that we can leave is not a statue of ourselves. It's not, you know, uh, the obituary that's written about us. The greatest legacy that we can leave is being faithful followers of Jesus every day of our life until death, right? I mean, that's the greatest legacy that we can really leave. Being the person who follows Jesus in our marriage, being the person who follows Jesus in our parenting, the person who follows Jesus in the workplace, the person who lives for the Lord. That's the kind of thing we should be building up. That's the kind of treasure that we should store up for ourselves that will not decay or be destroyed. But I'm going to tell you this, like we can go look for it when we're in Israel next month for those of you who are coming, but that pillar is not there anymore. Like that pillar that Absalom was all excited about, it's gone right? What's going to really last? It's not these types of things. These are the kind of things we build in pride. The legacies that we build in the spirit are legacies of loving and following Jesus and inspiring the people around us to do the same. Look what it says here in verse 19. Then Ahimaaz, the son of Zadok, said, let me run and carry news to the king that the Lord has delivered him from the hand of his enemies. And Joab said to him, you are not to carry news today. You may carry news another day, but today you shall carry no news because the king's son is dead. And then Joab said to the Cushite, go tell the king what you have seen. And the Cushite bowed before Joab and ran. And then Haimaz, the son of Zadok, said again to Joab, Come what may, let me also run after the Cushite. And Joab said, Why will you run, my son, seeing that you will have no reward for the news? Come what may, he said, I will run. So he said to him, Run. And then Haimaz ran by the way of the plain and outran the Cushite. Now, David was sitting between the two gates, and the watchman went up to the roof of the gate by the wall. And when he lifted up his eyes and looked, he saw a man running alone. And the watchman called out to him and told the king. And the king said, if he is alone, there is news in his mouth. And he drew nearer and nearer. And the watchman saw another man running. And the watchman called to the gate and said, see another man running alone. And the king said, he also brings news. And the watchman said, I think the running of the first is like the running of Ahimaaz, the son of Zadok. And the king said, he is a good man and comes with good news. Then Ahimaaz cried out to the king, all is well. And he bowed before the king with his face to the earth and said, blessed be the Lord your God who has delivered up the men who have raised their hand against my Lord the king. And the king said, is it well with the young man Absalom? And Ahimaaz answered, when Joab sent the king's servant, your servant, I saw a great commotion, but I do not know what it was. And the king said, 
turn aside and stand here. So he turned aside and stood still. Let's just stop there for one second before we read this next part. I don't know if you guys caught what's happening here, but these two guys, one's an Israelite, one's a Cushite, right? They both get commissioned to go give the news. But Ahimaaz beats the Cushite, and when he gets there, he only gives the good part of the news, not the bad news. Did you catch that? He says, hey, your enemies have been defeated. And then David says, well, what about my son? And he goes, I don't know. I saw a lot of stuff happening. A lot of things were going on. Got a little foggy back there. Not really sure what happened. Now, that's a lie, right? He knows exactly what happened. But here comes the Cushite, a foreigner. And what it says in verse 31. And behold, the Cushite came. And the Cushite said, good news for my lord, the king. For the Lord has delivered you this day from the hand of all who rose up against you. And the king said to the Cushite, is it well with the young man Absalom? And the Cushite answered, may the enemies of my lord, the king, and all who rise up against you for evil be like that young man. And the king was deeply moved. And he went up to the chamber over the gate and wept. And as he went, he said, oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom. Would I have died instead of you, O Absalom, my son, my son. It's a sad moment, really. Why is David so upset? Normally when you receive news that your enemy has been defeated, you're at least a little excited. Well, obviously the answer is it's his son, right? Like you guys are like, duh, Pastor Josh, like we know this one. But it's not about that. It's, I mean, it is, but it's not. See, David knows that his son has died, and, and that's terrible. But David also knows that this whole rebellion, this whole thing, was triggered originally by his own compromise. His own sinful behavior. His lack of discipline when it came to speaking into Absalom's life and the way that he reacted to his brother's uh, rape of his half-sister. The, the way that Absalom came back out of exile and was given free reign and the fact that David wouldn't come to see him and didn't comfort him, didn't fully forgive. I mean, all of these things that David had done had led to this. Now, is David 100% responsible for Absalom's sin? No, by no means. Absalom is his own man who built his own pillars and rode his own donkey and got caught by his own hair. But David knows that he had a part to play in this. And so he's weeping and he says, I wish I had died instead of you. He was not responsible, but he was indirectly responsible for what had happened. And so because of that, you know, he's weeping over the death of his son. And I just think it's interesting how the first guy, Ahimaaz, comes and delivers the good news, but not the bad news. And it's not until the foreigner comes that he delivers the good news and the bad news. And I think, you know, there's two different kinds of ways that we can deliver news. Like we can tell the whole truth, the good news and the bad news, or we can tell a partial truth, just the good news. And I just thought, man, as I was reading this uh, a couple days ago, I was just thinking to myself yesterday, I was thinking to myself, you know, there's kind of two ways that we come with the gospel as well, right? Like some people preach a message that says, hey, Jesus loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life, which is number one, true, and number two, great news, but they never get around to the part about repenting of your sin and turning and, you know, <laughs> changing your life and following Jesus. They just get to the first part. And we can't really fully understand the news until someone comes along and gives us the, the bad news. So the, the good news is Jesus loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. The bad news is you have to die to yourself and be given new life. Again, good news in Christ. So... We have to be careful when it comes to sharing our faith that we give the whole news and not just the good news. But I just thought about that as I was reading this. But also, David progressively walks into this emotional state, first by hearing that he won and now by hearing uh, about the, the death of Absalom. And we have to understand that for Joab, who we're about to read about his reaction to this in a second, and for the people around, this would have been confusing. This would have been confusing. Because, again, when kings win battles, they celebrate. They have parades. They have feasts. And instead, David is just up in the gate 
weeping, wishing that he had died instead. So verse 1 of chapter 19, it says this. It was told Joab, behold, the king is weeping and mourning for Absalom. So the victory that day was turned into mourning for all the people. For the people heard that day, the king is grieving for his son. And the people stole into the city that day as people steal in who are ashamed when they flee in battle. They're all depressed. They're all sad. Verse 4, the king covered his face and the king cried with a loud voice, Oh, my son, Absalom. Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. And then Joab came into the house and said to the king, You have today covered with shame the face of all your servants who have this day saved your life and the lives of your sons and your daughters and the lives of your wives and your concubines because you love those who hate you and hate those who love you. For you have made it clear today that the commanders and servants are nothing to you. For today I know that if Absalom were alive and all of us were dead today, then you would be pleased. Now therefore arise, go out and speak kindly to your servants. For I swear by the Lord, if you do not go, not a man will stay with you this night. And this will be worse for you than all the evil that has come upon you from your youth until now. Then the king arose and took his seat in the gate. And the people were all told, behold, the king is sitting in the gate and all the people came before the king. This is a strong play from Joab, isn't it? The king's out there weeping and mourning his son. And Joab says, you need to get it together, man. If you don't get it together and go and let the people celebrate their victory, we're all going to leave. And I can't believe you, David, because if Absalom was alive and I was dead, you would be happy. We can see here that Joab had a very love-hate relationship with David. And it's interesting that we'll see in just a few verses when we get there that David would actually replace Joab as commander of the army after this whole incident. But he didn't kill Joab. He didn't lean hard to Joab. But as David was dying, and if you want to read it for extra credit, you can read it in 1 Kings chapter 2. We don't have time. I'm already reading a lot tonight, okay? But in 1 Kings chapter 2, David says to Solomon, hey, when I'm gone, take care of Joab. So when David dies, Solomon sends people to go kill Joab. And they find Joab in the altar of the temple, clinging to the altar with his hand, believing that they wouldn't kill him if he was holding on to the presence of God. And he basically dares his executioners, go ahead, kill me in the presence of God. And so they go back to Solomon and they say, Solomon, Joab won't come out of the temple so we can kill him. And Solomon says, I don't care, go in and kill him. And so they went in there and they murder him right on the altar of the Lord and kill Joab. That's how his story ends. We're not going to read 1 Kings necessarily right away, so I just thought I'd tell you how it ends. But uh, they have a love-hate relationship. So, uh, <laughs> mostly hate. And so David, uh, David remembers this moment. David remembers this later on, and he has Solomon take care of it. Now, look what it says in verse 8. Now Israel had fled every man to his own home. And all the people were arguing throughout all the tribes of Israel, saying, The king delivered us from the hand of our enemies and saved us from the hand of the Philistines. And now he has fled out of the land from Absalom. But Absalom, who we have anointed over us, is dead in battle. Now, therefore, why do you say nothing about bringing the king back? And King David sent this message to Zadok and Abathar the priests, say to the elders of Judah, why should you be the last to bring the king back to his house when the word of all Israel has come to the king? You are my brothers, you are my bone and my flesh. Why then should you be the last to bring back the king? And say to Amasa, are you not my bone and my flesh? God do so to me and more also if you are not the commander of my army from now on in the place of Joab. And he swayed the heart of all the men of Judah as one man so that they sent word to the king, return both you and all your servants. And so the king came back to the Jordan and Judah came to Gilgal to meet the king and to bring the king over the Jordan. Interesting 
that this is how it goes down. So basically what's happening is the men of Judah and, and the southern part of Israel, they're saying, well, what are we going to do now? Like, David was king, and he did a lot of great stuff for us. But we all anointed Absalom king. And now he's dead. So what are we going to do now? And basically, through the, the words of intermediaries, David says, well, I'll come back. Like, let me just come back. And Amasa, I know that you were the leader of Absalom's army. But we're all cousins here. You're the bone of my bone, the flesh of my flesh. I'll tell you what. You will now be the leader of my army instead of Joab. Apparently, this encounter with Joab was David's last straw. And he says, Amasa, you will be the leader of my army now. And so, in a sense, he's brokered peace because now the leader of Absalom's army is the leader of David's army, and there's this reunification there in the southern part of Israel. And so, he comes back to the Jordan River to cross back into the Judah. And they all meet him there to ceremoniously lead him back into his kingdom. Now, whew, there's been a lot of reading going on tonight, hasn't there? Uh, there's a little bit more, so bear with me, okay? We're going to blow through these three uh, men that David speaks to, and I'll just comment really quickly on each one. And Shimei, the son of Gera, the Benjaminite from Barum, hurried down to come down with the men of Judah to meet King David. And with him were a thousand men of Benjamin. And Ziba, the servant of the house of Saul, with his 15 sons and his 20 servants, rushed down to the Jordan before the king. And they crossed the ford to bring over the king's household and to do his pleasure. And Shimei, or Shimei, the son of Gera, fell down before the king as he was about to cross the Jordan and said to the king, let not my Lord hold me guilty or remember how your servant did wrong on the day my Lord the king left Jerusalem. Do not let the king take it to heart for your servant knows that I have sinned. Therefore, behold, I have come this day, the first of all the house of Joseph to come down to meet my Lord the king. And Abishai, the son of Zeruah, said, Shall not Shimei be put to death for this, because he cursed the Lord's anointed? But David said, What have I to do with you and your sons of Zeruah, that you should this day be as an adversary to me? Shall anyone be put to death in Israel this day? For do I not know that I am this day king over Israel? And the king said to Shimei, You shall not die. And the king gave him his oath. Let's stop there for just a second. Do you remember this guy from last week? Last week, as they were walking out of Israel, he was running alongside David saying, See, David, you brought this on yourself. You killed my cousin Saul's family, and now you're going to have to pay for it. God is judging you, David. You are never going to be king again. And guess what? Now David's king again. And so he's the first one to show up at the procession, at the parade, and say, I'm so sorry, David. I did not know what I was saying. And, and David's uh, soldiers are like, hey, let's kill this guy. Like, he deserves it. And David's like, no, do not deal harshly with him. There will be no more killing today, right? And I love that. I love the compassion that we see. David forgives a man who cursed him. He forgives a man who spoke ill of him. Uh, in the same way, I guess, there's a contrast there that Jesus forgives us, Right? When we spoke ill of him, when we were in full rebellion against him, he offered grace and mercy. David, again, showing humility and godliness, offers grace and mercy to this guy. And with them is Ziba. Now, Ziba and this whole thing is interesting because if you remember, um, they were the ones who told David, Mephibosheth, who was the last son of Jonathan, uh, who was the son of Saul, who David took the throne from, um, that if you remember, his servant told David that Mephibosheth had gone to Jerusalem to side with Absalom against David. And it was such a heartbreaking thing for David because here was a guy that he had shown mercy to who was now uh, rebelling against him. Or at least that's what he was told. But look what we see here in verse 24. And Mephibosheth, the son of Saul, came down to meet the king. And he had neither taken care of his feet, nor trimmed his beard, nor washed his clothes from the day that the king had departed until the day he came back in safety. And when he came to Jerusalem to meet the king, the king said to him, Why did you not go with me, Mephibosheth? And he answered, My lord, O king, my servant deceived me. For your servant said to him, I will saddle a donkey for myself, that I might ride on it and go with the king. For your servant is lame. He has slandered your servant to my lord the king. But my lord the king is like the angel of God. 
Do therefore what seems good to you. For all my father's house were but men doomed to death before my lord the king. But you have set your servant among those who eat at your table. What further right have I then to cry to the king? And the king said to him, why speak any more of your affairs? I have decided you and Ziba shall divide the land. And Mephibosheth said to the king, oh, let him take it all since my lord the king has come safely home. What an awesome display of loyalty. I mean, when David was down in the dumps when he was leaving Jerusalem and thought that Mephibosheth had betrayed him, there's no way that he could have anticipated this incredible act of loyalty. As Mephibosheth says, hey, I didn't leave you. My, my servant deceived you. And so David says, okay, I see what this was all about. Ziba wanted your stuff, so we'll just split it. You can have half, and they can have half. And Mephibosheth says, I don't care about all that. I'm just so grateful that you have come home. See, Mephibosheth wasn't loyal for the reward. He wasn't loyal because of what he was gaining. He wasn't loyal to the king because he got to sit at the king's table. He was loyal because he loved the king and was grateful for what the king had done to him. And it's the same for us. Like, we are not loyal to Jesus because of the benefits we get. Right? We're not loyal to Jesus like, hey, we're going to follow Jesus so that one day we can have a mansion in heaven and we can sit at the king's table. That's not what this is about. Those are benefits. But well, the reason that we follow Jesus is because of what he's done for us. He says, hey, my family, my life was, might as well have been dead, but you, King David, rescued me from that death and seated me at your table. That's what he says. And isn't that our story? <laughs> that Jesus rescued us from certain death and destruction and brought us in to be considered part of his family and to sit at his table. So we don't serve for the reward. And Mephibosheth says, I don't want half of that stuff. Give it, to him. Give it all to Ziba. I don't care. If this is about our relationship. This is, I'm just grateful that you're here. And I think just sometimes as Christians, we should think about that because we're all looking forward to heaven and we're all looking forward to the benefits of being with Jesus forever. But those are not the reward. Like Jesus himself is the reward. Like we get to be with him in a relationship with him. It's not about the gold and, hey, how, what kind of mansion are you going to have in heaven? And, you know, how many floors is yours going to be? And how many crowns are you going to get? Like, that's why the Bible tells us that on the last day, like the people who receive crowns for all the things they did for the Lord will do what? Throw them down before his feet and say, it was all for you. It wasn't for the crown. And Mephibosheth says, take all this stuff. It's not for me. I'm just so glad that you're here. His presence, David's presence, was the most important thing to Mephibosheth. And Jesus' presence should be the most important thing to us. And we round it out here in verse 31. Now, Barzili, Barzili, the Gileite, had come down from Rogliam, and he went on with the king to the Jordan and to escort him over the Jordan. And Barzili was a very aged man, 80 years old. He had provided the king with food while he stayed at Manaheim, for he was a very wealthy man. And the king said to him, come over with me and I will provide food for you with me in Jerusalem. But he said to the king, how many years have I still to live that I should go up with the king to Jerusalem? I am this day 80 years old. Can I discern what is pleasant and what is not? Can your servant even taste what he eats and drinks? Can I still listen to the voice of a singing men or singing women? Why then should your servant be an added burden to my lord the king? Your servant will go a little way over the Jordan with the king. Why should the king repay me with such a reward? Please let your servant return that I may die in my own city near the grave of my father and my mother. But here is your servant, Chimham. Let him go over with the Lord, my, my Lord, the king and do for him whatever seems good to you. And the king answered, Chimham shall go over with me and I will do for him whatever seems good to you and all that you desire of me, I will do for you. And then all the people went over the Jordan and the king went over and the king blessed Brazilia and blessed him and he returned him, kissed, I'm sorry, and blessed him and he returned to his own home. And the king went on to Gilgal and Chimham went on with him. And all the people of Judah and also half the people of Israel brought the king on his way. So just a quick thought about this guy. 
Uh, this was one of the guys that had provided resources for David in his time in the wilderness. And David says, hey, you come home with me and you can sit at my table and I'll bless you. And he's like, dude, I'm not even going to enjoy that. Like if I go, I'm so old, like I'm not going to be able to hear the songs from the concerts and I'm not going to be able to taste the food. Like it's not worth it. But here's my son. Take my son and treat him that way. And actually one of the other final things besides David telling Solomon to kill Joab, one of the final things that David would tell Solomon was to make sure that this guy's family was taken care of for the rest of his life. So David fulfilled this promise for those who supported him. Verse 41, as we end, and then all the men of Israel came to the king and said to the king, why have our brothers, the men of Judah, stolen you away and brought the king and his household over the Jordan and all of David's men with him? And all the men of Judah answered the men of Israel, because the king is our close relative. Why then are you angry over this matter? Have we eaten at all at the king's expense or has he given us any gift? And the men of Israel answered the men of Judah, we have 10 shares in the king and in David also we have more than you. Why then did you despise us? Were we not the first to speak of bringing back our king? But the words of the men of Judah were fiercer than the words of the men of Israel. And what you just have to understand from all of this is that this is going to be the beginning of the civil war that is ultimately going to wreck this nation not too long off from now, where everybody thought that because the, the line of David came from the tribe of Judah, that they were receiving special treatment over the other tribes in the northern part of the kingdom. And this built resentment, and all of that comes back to the days of Absalom and David, fulfilling what Nathan the prophet had told David, that the sword would forever be with his family, that there was always going to be strife and war that came from this uh, thing, this incident that David had with Bathsheba. So we see here the beginnings of that, and as we keep reading in the next couple of weeks, we'll see kind of some of that murmuring again uh, as the people are divided over this. Um, but David returns to Jerusalem and returns to reigning as king. I hope you guys enjoyed that. It, it's a lot, I know, but it's all one story. So it seems silly to break it into different parts, but hopefully I read it excitingly. I didn't necessarily read all the names accurately, but uh, we tried. So let's pray. Lord, thank you uh, for tonight. Thank you, Lord, for the, the privilege it is to, to read your word, Lord. I know that if we just read your word it would already be enough and that anything that I have to say and add to it just makes it worse. But Lord, we want to understand. We want to understand the context. We want to see uh, your truths spoken in these things. And Lord, when it comes to the story of Absalom and his death, Lord, we don't want to be like that. We don't want to walk in pride. We don't want to walk in, in a way that props up statues of ourselves and leaves a legacy of pride that leads to destruction and, and chaos. Lord, we want to walk humbly with you. In fact, I think of how uh, the prophet encourages us to uh, walk justly, love mercy, and walk humbly. Lord, we want to do that. We want to be with you. We want to we we humbly serve you, not consumed and, and worried about how other people, how they perceive us, but Lord, walking humbly, following after you, Jesus. Lord, help us to be like Mephibosheth, who wasn't interested in the benefits of relationship uh, with David, but was interested in the presence of David and the person of what, who David was and what he had done for him. Lord, help us to have that same attitude. Help us uh, to walk in such a way that we're not concerned about if we're going to heaven because we're going to get a mansion or something like that. But Lord, we're concerned about you. We want to be in your presence. We love you, Jesus. And that's our heart's desire. Help that to be true in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together. Give thanks to the Lord.